Uh, you mentioned that it's proof of stake. Could you elaborate a little bit on how that fits in taxonomy and play that different happy stages? That's a great question, actually. We did not touch on this, so this is really important. In a private network, when you deploy a private network, it's typically one computer, one vote. So when you, if you remember back to those images of the members, every member would submit a vote. And in a private system, you trust that, right? That's okay, because you can deploy 10 nodes inside an IBM regional office and say, oh, these 10 nodes distribute this application, we get our DDoS resilience, right? Um, what, you, what you can't do is in a public network, do one node, one vote, okay? You, if you do one node, one vote, you're vulnerable to a class of attack called civil attack. A civil attack is when a bad actor can take 10,000 nodes. Now these are probably VPSs or digital ocean instances where you take these 10,000 nodes, throw them onto the network and say, I have 10,000 votes and you disrupt consensus, right? You ruin the whole network. So what you need is a scarce economic resource. So mathematically what we do is we do one coin, one vote. So what you need to do then is you need to protect because the definition of asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerance is resistance to a 33% attack where you have 33%, uh, it would be 33% plus one. So a third plus one of all the coins in circulation consolidated by a bad actor. That would disrupt consensus. So how do you prevent that from happening? Governance body. You have this governance body that it are the trustees for a multi-signature role that decide with a signature on when the coin gets released into the supply. Now there's a schedule where at the beginning, the, the genesis of the network, as you call it, where those coins, you cannot, have, you cannot have a third plus one floated on day one. It would be fairly trivial with a lower value for, for a bad actor like, let's say, the evil North Korean hermit kingdom to consolidate all the coins and disrupt hashcraft consensus. Right? So, so the, the council, um, almost like a central bank, releases the coins? Correct. Now, they don't own the coins, but they act as trustees, and they release it for the public good of the network. Now, they have an economic incentive because we, we don't trust the council either. Right? But the council has an economic incentive to protect the supply of the coins, to ensure that the network continues. So what the council does is they vote over time. Now there is a set schedule initially, but the idea, so for the first, I'll be transparent with all of you, for the first five years, there will not be anything close to a third of the coins in circulation. There's a very tiny float. The idea there is that it becomes economically prohibitive over time for a bad actor to consolidate all of the coins so that later more supply can be released. So they the, provide the scarcity as opposed to the difficulty of yeah. finding prime numbers. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So they are the they are the mechanism through which scarcity is preserved in the early days. And thus asynchronous Byzantine call tolerant is preserved. Where where they, they are staking their their nodes on the network stake those transactions. Yeah. Yes. Are these thirty nine entities anonymous? No, no no no. It's a good question. So we, we you know, we, we wanted to announce the names on stage in New York. Uh, we decided not to. Um, trying, to get, uh, trying to get a bunch of companies together to agree on a press release and whose name goes first is quite difficult. Uh, and they all have rather restrictive uh, PR departments. We love them to death if any of them are listening. Uh, please don't hate me for saying that. But uh, what, we, what we've decided to do is we are going to make a separate announcement this fall. We'll announce some of it at a, we haven't even talked about this publicly, but I'm happy to share with you that this fall we have about 3,000 developers joining us for DevCon. We have not announced where DevCon will be. We have a big developer conference where a lot of our ecosystem will be there. We will be announcing the location shortly, and some of our governing members will also come. Their CEOs and CTOs and heads of emerging tech will be there to announce what they've done. Many of them are all actually building private POCs where they're using the network to build stuff internally, and then they hope to release distributed applications. Everyone in the planet will know all of the names when we launch. So, you know, when, when, when we're at scale, all the names will be fully released. Yep. Uh, yeah, please, behind you. So, uh, what's the governance process for those 39 members? How do they get elected? How do they um, rotate? Yep. How does that work? That's a great question. So, uh, you have to prevent against a bunch, against a bunch of things. Uh, one of them is stagnation. How do you prevent lame duck uh, members? that aren't doing a whole bunch. So they're actually term limited, and they're limited to two consecutive three-year terms, is first and foremost. So uh, right after six years, you're out. If you've served those full six years, you must leave. It's a requirement. And then someone else will come. And if it was decided that you were good enough to come back, the members vote on that. So there is a membership committee. Let's start with that. That's a great starting point. Now, you, you have to start somewhere. So initially, the vision for this 
but we should probably even go way back. Let's go back to 1960, okay? There was a guy named D. Hawk. Has anyone heard that name? A guy, guy named D. Hawk started with the same set of problems when he tried to start Visa. How do you get a bunch of competing organizations to come together to create an output that will create this international payments organization, which is a really remarkable organization, but what is the governance process for putting that in place? Visa has more than 20,000 members today, which is incredible. Um, we started with a book that he wrote called One From Many. I highly recommend anyone listening to buy this because I think this, these chaotic organizations, we're only going to see more of them as distributed networks become more popular because the element of centralization is a benevolent dictator. The element of centralization is when the code base is controlled by political core developers. You need to have proper governance in place. So we started with Hawk's book, so there is precedent for a governance body like this. Then what we did is we created a membership committee where we had certain criteria being best in class. There's also rules where if, if a governing member breaks a law or is held in violation of some international treaty, there's a process for the members to come to consensus, literally uh, amongst themselves, come to consensus, much like the nodes in the network, about removing a member. There's also a membership committee for new members applying and how you replace them and how you keep the geodiversity and how you keep all, uh, and how you keep the uh, diversity across industry sector. All of these bylaws and all of this will be published on the website. And we're going one step further. We will retroactively publish the minutes from the meetings that the members have. So the entire world will have insight, also stored on the ledger, of what's happening inside these governance meetings, which I also think is really killer. That in itself is a killer app, right? So not like anyone would watch it, it'd probably be like a really bad C-SPAN, but uh, you know, it would still be, it'd still be in public records, still be available, so people have insight into it. Could they, Did that answer your question? Okay. Could they on their first meeting say, okay, we're not gonna, we're not gonna allow the, the, the minutes to be public anymore? Uh, so, like what, what kind of yeah, power do they have? Yeah, so, so, so there's mechanisms in place. Many decisions actually require a complete unanimous uh, decision. Um, and many, many of them require just a simple majority. Some of them require two thirds majority. So there's different sort of classes. Like a constitution. Yes, there is a constitution. There's a set of bylaws. Every member, the process, in full transparency, the process that the members are in right now behind the scenes is, you could say, sort of brokering term sheets, brokering the final membership documents, where they are coming to agreement just now on how they're all going to collaborate and work together. That's a really hard process. We have a slew of people working on solving that problem. That's really non-technical, but that's really important. That's if you get that wrong, the public network will the public network will have bad governance, which doesn't make it better than what else is in the marketplace. We think we have it right because where we started, and Visa being a great example of this, we started to really with a really strong position, and as it turns out, others have done this and have done it really well. So when you take that and copy that over, I also think it will work well because Hedera isn't much different. And I don't want to attract unwanted attention from these are MasterCard here, but uh, Hedera isn't much different than an international payments network in the way it will function at scale. How do you, how yep. do you just to follow that up, like, how do you make sure that the ethics are pro-people and not just pro-companies? Because if you look at the news, it's like every single day we see now yep. where large companies, banks, uh, auto companies, they go ahead and do what's right for them, and then they save a bit of money to settle later yeah. on. Yeah. So how do you prevent that? How do you prevent some sort of, sort of form of tyranny from taking place where these companies are doing things that are not in the overall interest of humanity? In some ways? So what we've done is we simultaneously started a separate organization called the Distributed Ledger Foundation, and that organization is tasked with exactly what you're talking about, which is first and foremost helping to bridge the gap between legal coders and actual coders because there's a massive gap today. I actually don't think there's any legal precedent for a smart contract to be held up in a court of law. So can we still call it a contract? When is that legal precedent gonna come? I, I can't wait to see what the precedent on that will be. And then, you know, even just running a project like Hedera in America requires all sorts of stepping on eggshells, but I would say that there's also the social implications of that. We funded a free and fair voting initiative, so that's the first social good cause that we're happy to throw our name behind, which will end up being this international effort to prevent voter fraud. Uh, you know, I spent the last seven years over in Budapest, Hungary, and they just had a really terrible election by the far right, where I argue that wasn't a very fair election at all. And they've really demonized Western, you know, liberal thinking institutions like 
Central European University, what we need is better insight into the voting processes over there, and doing it on a ledger is perfect. If we trust the ledger, we can see the provenance of every vote. Every citizen, every vote, we would run real and fair elections. So a free and fair voting initiative, that's going to change. That's, that's a great starting place to change the world. Now, we are light years away from really you know, being there. By light years, I mean probably a year or two more. But uh, you know, it's, it's frustrating uh, working with these groups. And you're going to need international chaotic organizations like the United Nations or, or you know, other consortia to come together and help put this in place. But I, I think you're going to start to see this uh, start to see this sooner rather than later. Yeah, Dimitri. Hey, Jordan. I'm curious. You've done so many events now. How many have you done? How many uh, people do you think you've spoken to since you guys uh, started doing this? Man, I mean, when we met you, probably like 500 people I talked to. Now we're probably approaching, I mean, collectively across the whole company, uh, I'd say. Or you, you. Me, me personally. How many people have you spoken I mean, I have a follow up question about it. How many people have I talked to? Uh, no, well, not to give me an exact yeah, that's right. I don't know. Uh, maybe 10,000 max. I imagine, I imagine many. Yeah. So I'm curious, um, with, Hedera, with the implementation on Hedera, you have to secure the network, right? So yeah. you use delegated proof of stake. I'm curious. Not delegated proof of stake. I mean, delegated, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, so I'm curious if people uh, express confusion about, um, the, about the consensus mechanism for Hedera, given the fact that, let's say, Ethereum wants to move to proof of stake. Uh, do they? Uh, do you, do you, what are some interesting questions that people ask you where they express some level of confusion about how a consensus process works yeah. for a POS system on a blockchain versus one that has a consensus protocol, which is the hash graph, but then which uses POS to secure the network? Sure, sure. Let me. I, I'm going to try to answer your question by first saying we will start proof of stake. I do not envy the position that Vitalik is in right now. And I think you can see a lot of his frustration in some of his recent comments. He's in a really hard spot, and I feel for the guy. He needs to rally and get the community of miners to come to consensus on upgrading the platform. And I think you have a lot of social problems associated with doing that, because I don't believe the miners actually want to move over to that. They're making so much money just mining in a proof of work system, they don't really want to upgrade to a Casper or something like that. Now, Ethereum today has tragedy the commons problems, but I think that's their economic model. You're asking about consensus. People do ask questions about how proof of, how proof of stake works uh, because they understand it through economy-based systems like a Casper proposal. They are confused, namely, at how you achieve asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerance security with proof of stake. And then that question, they get more clarity when they see the governance group. And then the skeptics, the anarchists that hear this, are like, absolutely not. We don't want to submit to a governance group of 39 of the biggest companies on the planet. Uh, and I, I respect that. I understand that. But if, we're, if the space is to mature or to go forward, I would say proof of stake gives you the ABFT security, but we don't trust the network to preserve ABFT security because there's going to be bad actors in the network. So we need to trust someone. And we better not trust someone. We better trust the collective someone. And that collective can be this council. So I'd say that's typically where we get friction and full transparency is with the, it's with the governance council because it's really different. And people say it's Ripple-esque. It's not. They actually have control of the code base here and the platform. And truthfully, they own the company. Like, we are 139. Exactly. No, no more. We're conflict of interest. So we govern in a way that we work for the company. Not for the not for the user or the holder or whatever whatever asset. So you could you could argue that, but you know, greedy, greedy people it's are proven. Well, it's, it's proven. Yeah, I, I would I would argue that because I'd say that greedy greed is predictable. You know when it's coming. You know that companies are going to act same, same way. I mean, uh, well, there is an you know, but you know, but you do know that they're going to act in their economic interests to preserve the security of the network. They're How going can to you make sure that the economic interest is because important. they make money. They make money. They get one thirty ninth of the money. So they can lobby the outside of it. But they have no interest to collude. They have to. They have to keep the. They have to keep the security of the network. But isn't there also a point to be made that the fact that I think in, in, in the Bitcoin network, because proof of work has economy of, economies of scale that manifest in centralization. So what is the centralization of the Bitcoin network? Two or three miners. Right? Well, so, it's it's all yes. In you can call it China coin because the, yeah. the hashing power is in China. If we nationalize that, then China controls Bitcoin. So you, you, have, the same, you have the same problem. I mean, all the ha the majority of the hashing power is there. Also, to be clear, that type of the type of centralization he's talking about is is before you reach a certain scale where the market cap is large enough to sustain. Sure. 
right? So this is basically the incubation period. Yeah, and, and that's what we're in. You have to get the network live. So you need a period of time where the dream would be to, and we just found out this is not even legal, you can't, if you could just drop, you could just drop this across the entire, airdrop it across the entire world, right? That's the dream. Every person on the planet. But how do you get it to them? How do you get it to them? You need to have them connected to the network first. So the full vision is that every person on the planet is going to have this platform token. And you don't have to trust the members because they don't hold the consensus votes. But you need to get there somehow. And there's not a good answer on how to do it. Right? We could try to literally airdrop and just drop phones in North Korea and drop phones here. And you know, there's actually someone's got a really great proposal on that. But practically, it doesn't really work. So you, this is the incubation of what becomes this global distributed network where every person on the planet has access to this. Yes? Um, one thing that I found that was uh, concerning to me, especially during tax season, is the, tra is the tax and the transaction of cryptocurrencies. It's terrible. And now what's being proposed, or if it hasn't been passed, I'm pretty sure it's been passed already, that you won't even have to convert your cryptocurrency into fiat. Yep. Your, it will be taxed on these particular trades. It's already passed. Be careful. It's already passed. If you just, yes. if you just sell PTH for an altcoin. I thought so. It has passed. It's uh, with the new tax update. Mm -hmm. It's not that one in. So I can suggest moving to Puerto Rico. It's a really beautiful place. Uh, but if you don't want to dodge paying taxes and you want to stay here, like uh, I think it's, you know, New York's a great place to be. Yeah, it's, it's, it's painful. It's not conducive for day trading crypto anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, do you have, um, are you making any adjustments to that law that will help users to be aware of their tax liability? Yeah, so we, what we are doing with the Distributed Ledger Foundation, we hired this guy, Don Tebow. Don Tebow built standards in the identity space. He built the Open ID Exchange. And this guy is a Washington, you could call him, I don't want to scare you with the term, but he's a Washington networker. He knows the people in power. What we've, what we've decided to do with our foundation is not create a tech-specific foundation. We didn't want to create the Ethereum Foundation or the IOTA Foundation or really like a hashcraft specific foundation because as it turns out, you can't get a meeting with the Senate Finance Committee with a foundation called Company Foundation, right? You can if you call it the Distributed Ledger Foundation and you invite Ethereum, which we've done, and invite IOTA and invite all the other protocols to come and collaboratively address the problem, which is our starting point, what we've done. So we have started by capitalizing this organization. How much money did we put in the DLF already? Million? More than a million, I think, at this yeah. stage. But we're continuing to put money in this group. We just opened an office in DC, and we are inviting other protocols to match the money we're putting in here because we all, this high tide, this open source legal community that we all should join, this will help IOTA, it will help Ethereum, it will help Neil, it will help guys like you, it will help anyone that wants to be actively investing and trading in this space. And frankly, it will help create projects here. Right now, it's scary. When we're actually starting Hashgraph, I'm ashamed to even admit that the question is, can we even do this in America? Do we have to go to Singapore? As an entrepreneur should never be tasked with trying to answer that question, right? We should say, obviously we should do it here in America. America is the best place in the world to start a country. But it's funny, you know, we just got back from Roadshow in Korea and Japan and Singapore and things are a lot more lax over there, you know? They, they embrace you with open arms. Oh, you want to start a crypto company? Great, we'll give you a government grant, we'll give you this. It's incredible. I mean, the, the amount of innovation over there is, is, is great. I think I think we can be like that here in the United States. Okay. We just have to get our shit together. Yeah, the thing that worries me is not not even just trade. Yeah. If you want to conduct commerce, like you want to sell a good yeah. using cryptocurrencies, you can't even do that here yeah. because of yeah. the tax law. Yeah. I, I, if it means anything, I feel your pain, man. Yeah. <laughs> I really do. It's it's. It's it's brutal, uh, I, you know. But there's gotta you, ha you have to abide by the laws here. And, uh, for, 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 for this going forward, I don't see it changing tomorrow. But I think that we can, if we can be one small part of that change, I'd love Vitalik and his crew to join us, and I'd love I love the IOTA guys. We'd love to be working with the people that the market sees as our competitors. This is a problem for all of us. Mm -hmm. And it's not just an America-specific problem. We're doing this in London and in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. We're taking this to the regulators, uh, the Financial Conduct Authority uh, for a lot of the Commonwealth, the you know, UK, Australia, Singapore. A lot of these countries are based on, uh, I think it's FCA, if I know the acronym right, a lot of their guidance. So we're, we're working on it. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
One of the problems I've beaten Vitalik's head quite a few times on there, and something you haven't addressed yourself on there, is yeah. digital identity. Sure. Because it seems like you are you are a victim of the same problem where everybody has collapsed digital identity into one public-private key pair, yeah. right? Yeah. Where authorization, access control, identification is in one key. Yeah. I steal your key, you lose your 401k. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, okay. I'm sorry, that's still voodoo and sci-fi? Yeah. Have you started addressing that? Because yeah. that's not on any one of your slides, and you kind of breezed over the entire topic. Yeah, so we don't we don't jump into a ton of identity here, but I will tell you that uh, Patrick Hardick, our new SVP product, served as the CTO of Ping Identity, a big player in the single sign-on identity space for the last 10 years. So identity is a major concern for us. We actually expect to have product features and product lines that help uh, organizations, application builders, uh, incorporate this. Practically, how some of those things work, uh, if you've been here the whole presentation, I, when I talk about the revocation service, I think there's a lot of really important things about even you being able to revoke your own credential that may be publicly exposed, or to be able to revoke who has access to it. So you can say that only this set of people have access to it and not everybody else. Really, I think that's the foundation of where a self-sovereign identity feature begins. We also are very close with the Sovereign Foundation, and we were just out in Denver with the folks over there uh, with the Sovereign Foundation. So. Yeah, yeah. Still, what people are not addressing on there is you still, privacy is still a protected right, yeah. which basically means that you cannot use one digital identity that can be traced across all asset classes on there. Sure. Use Wall Street, for example, on yeah. there. You should see that a transaction occurred, but you shouldn't see those Goldman Sachs versus JP Morgan because that oh, being so identity, you mean encrypting who the transaction is coming from. I, I want to make sure it's a privacy friendly identity uh -huh. system on yeah, there yeah. so that this way. Yeah. You can you you, yeah. you have a new identity for every single transaction. Good point. Where you can only disclose because the problem is is when you get into the public ledges on there, <coughs> regulatory sweeping is going to occur. Yep. And you can't have Congress or whomever come in and say, You're right. I need you I need to know your transaction. Yep. You should have it for this two week time period, not your entire ten year history. That's yeah. No, you're you're exactly right. So here's what we're doing on that. Uh, I misunderstood your question. What we're doing on that is we don't take a position here or there. We don't give the government your information, and we give you the complete right to be anonymous. Of course, it's just Li a network. Yeah, exactly, it's just a network. Literally what you're doing is creating an account. You're right, the account has a public-private key pair, but it's your public-private key pair, no one knows who you are. But here's what we're expecting to happen, right? I, I expect the market to move to a set of policies where you have policy makers that are gonna say, okay, I didn't catch your name. Eric Anderson. Eric, Eric. So I expect the network to say, Let's say the DMV becomes the certificate authority. In the United States, sovereign government says the, D, the, the DMV is now the certificate authority. And we further say that Eric Anderson can never purchase a ticket on American Airlines, or anybody for that matter, can never purchase a ticket on American Airlines unless they buy it from a wallet that's undergone KYC AML. Sure, that solves KYC issues, yes. but it does not but, solve but, but, he, but here, let, let, let me finish, let me finish. We, when you issue your wallet, we do not require you to go undergo KYC AML. We don't need to know who you are. To the end of time, no one can know who you are. It is the case, Eric, that you may only be able to transact peer-to-peer -peer across the network. You may only be able to go to other peers because American Airlines may be under regulation that requires them not to take your money because they can only take money from KYC AML wallets. But we don't KYC AML you. That's at the application layer. The CA, the certificate authority, would probably issue you that wallet. So we don't, as a group, we want you to be as anonymous as you want to be. No one will ever know your account address. They won't know whether you're Goldman Sachs or my mom, right? You're completely anonymous. So uh, in, in terms of that, you're hidden, you're great, we give you that authority, we give you that permission. It just so happens we also are, recognize that CAs are definitely coming to the marketplace. I think you're gonna see this happen. There's no chance you're buying American Airlines flight with Bitcoin. That's never gonna happen. Right, unless you KYC AML that wallet. And when people want to start using their money for mainstream trend, we have a guy here from Overstock. Who's from Overstock? Scott. Yeah, Overstock. Oh, oh, you guys take Bitcoin, you guys take cryptocurrency. Today it's anonymous, but they're not, you're not selling, like, correct me if I'm wrong, you're not selling stuff to make like nuclear arms. You're not selling, you know, you're not selling any controlled substances or anything of that matter. So not even cigarettes. So, not even cigarettes. Seriously. <laughs> seriously, so. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. So you know, if you pay overstock in Bitcoin, you're still anonymous, right? Well, you probably typed in some of your information in the shopping cart, but you've got an account, right, yeah. and shipping address and all that. But you could create a new Bitcoin address and expose only that address and send money from that address and still stay relatively anonymous if you made the effort. So, yeah, but I'll but I'll also tell you, Jordan, I'm 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 working mostly in capital markets with T zero. Yeah. And and uh, KYC AML is a huge deal there. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. And in sure, sure. the regulated markets, you're going to be forced to do KYC AML. We have the tool set to do it. Again, we don't take a position. Just because we have the tool set, we still let you be completely anonymous. No one will ever know who you are if you want that. You just may not be able to do a whole lot on the network in some future offline 10 years from now where everything is regulated. Yeah, I mean, let me give you a good use case where this comes in. Is let's, let's call it near money. So this yep. way you don't have to worry about somebody, you know, something like piggy bank and stealing it on there. Yep. Because the main problem people had in the ledgers was they merged together, the ledger and the piggy bank together, that yep. you manipulate the ledger and you're taking over control of piggy bank. It should be a ledger of transaction. Order. So let me use the use case of their, of a near money, let's call it food stamps, yep. where you're going to go into stop and shop, whatever, you're going to make half of a purchase on a government regulated wiki, WIC product on there for mill, yep. but you're going to make the other half the purchase on some other assets that are not government regulated, uh -huh. where the government is going to need to be able to snoop in your transaction and see what you purchased, but then the, the other part of the transaction they're gonna, not going to need to be able to see. So, Solving those Don't they need to see the entire transaction if it's a food stamp? Yeah, uh, but it's going to be a split transaction on there. Where part of the identity that's okay. going to be public and visible to all is okay. that you should see that I use the government money Absolutely. for work. Yeah. Completely. Everybody should see that. Completely. But you shouldn't see that I bought Cheerios or some other brand of it sure. that is not government. So sure. solving that is more of an identity level yeah. where you're using more random identities that people can yeah. publicly So what, what you're talking about though, what you're talking about literally lives at the application layer. If there's an application that sits on top of these services Agreed. that is a food stamp application. But if application, you don't build it from the ground up. But we have built, so we build that from the ground up. You are completely anonymous at the account level. In our system, you're anonymous. If Whole Foods, or let's take the food stamp agency, I don't know the name of the WIC, if you take this group that issues food stamps, and at the application layer, they require you to submit what you bought with it, we, we can't control that because you opted in to use their application. It's the same thing like Facebook using the internet, right? Like Facebook requires you as a, as a, by using their service to give them your information, give them fake information, but you have to give them some set of information to use their service if they're business. Right, you're opting into that. That's application layer. At this core layer, your wallet, your account address, completely yeah. anonymous. I until you're making un somebody else's problem. Right. Until you talk to somebody that required you to disclose who you are. The second you do that, you're no longer anonymous. But when you integrate the right thing at the plumbing level, yeah. then not make it the application's problem yeah. to deal with. Because that's everybody's doing the same let, thing. Let, let's continue this because I'll tell you the plumbing there in the white paper, it's completely anonymous. You're not gonna know who anyone is on the network. It's impossible to actually know unless they tell you who they are. But once you have the public key, it's over. They know from the dawn of time going back, they can see all the transactions that well, you Oh are. yeah, they would see the flow of money, but that's a cryptocurrency application. You're talking about an application. No, I, even in your money, even in your money, even in a, a game currency too as well, integrated into a, a sure. MMO. Sure. You're still gonna see Fine. every transaction. Yes. Yes, they just won't know who you are. I mean, the, the IRS they can, can figure say, it out. Yeah. They can figure it out. Trust me. Yeah, it's not just the government or regulation. Sure. It's, they're going to find out. Companies. Sure. That they're doing so, already on Bitcoin. Right. I just they, see they, they're doing a Bitcoin. Exactly. So much so that if you try to if you try to claim tax or try to look at a Bitcoin wallet, I just will tell you if it ever touched a money laundering wallet. Or no, wallet. it's not just a KYC sure. governmental regulation yeah. thing. It's it's data mining by private companies yep. that are trying to figure out it's patterns of your transactions sure. and they can figure out based on yep. the pattern who you are. So, so then your literal like question is if, if we make if we make here in the plumbing, if we make your transactions anonymous, we make you anonymous. If someone wants to come in and download the complete anonymous record of every cryptocurrency exchange hands, we do not anonymize that information. That is on the network, you would be able to see that information. That's there. If you have an immutable public Yes, blockchain or hash graph or whatever Now what you, you can it. do is you can download at the SDK and you can be a Swirls customer and you can build that into your application and a private permission network where you know the nodes and compel people to opt into that. We do have companies that are very concerned about anonymity or possessing HIPAA compliant data or things like that. If you wanted to do that, we also have that service. On our public network, this is the feature set and the plumbing is it is what it is today. I mean, it will, it will change variably over time. But right, but when you are claiming that you're completely anonymous, that's not true. Yes. <laughs> sure. It's just not true. So, so we, we are not, we are... Well, even if it's true at this moment, moment it, it may not be true in the future because you're talking about an sure. immutable public record, we did ledger, not, we, slash, Correct. We, we, admittedly, we did not build the protocol 
with you to be anonymous in mind. That was not the main intention. Bitcoin was built for you to be completely anonymous, right? Although it's yeah, like but there's been some bips that have come out there where they're going to say, let's, let's say we're going to root it back in the original public private key, which we're not going to get away from the next 50 years, right? Yep. But when you use the elliptical curve multiplications, you can keep the multiply around. You have a brand new key for every single transaction that could be proved back to the original source. Of course, yeah. When you put something that at the plumbing level, you're because it's still provable back. If it would have been integrated at that level, I'd be very happy. Oh, okay, gotcha. It, yeah. You understand? I understand because the point. I understand the point. If you yeah. do that, yeah. at the plumbing then by, it's not it's only the yeah. app's problem to deal yeah. with the problem. Yeah. Then I don't I don't mean to mislead by saying it's anonymous. We do not do that. We're not giving you a changing public key that you're exposing over time. Yeah. Yeah, these, these are common problems that we've been working on across the industry. I've just never seen yeah. anybody do it. Your business model is exactly the same as everybody. Oh, I have my cryptocurrency on there. Here, here's how I incentivize you for being a market participant. But if you integrate that at the root level, it solves a lot of the problems. You can't leak your identity across. You can see that Eric Anderson, uh, you, you can't see that I went in the adult bookstore and bought something. Right? You can't see that that one key is disclosed everywhere. That is the root problem that most people are still not addressing. If it was put in at the plumbing sure. level, oh my God, you would have- They're not incentivized to do that, though. Of course they're not. Yeah. Yeah. There's no yeah. company that yeah. wants to do that. Yes, Bill. Hey, so Jordan, speaking about the Hashgraph SDK, so I know now what's out there is the Swirls SDK that's uh, pu you know publicly available, but do you, can you speak to maybe like some of the timelines as far as like when the Hashgraph uh, or the Hedera Hashgraph SDK is going to be released and the public can get their hands on it? Yep. So the, hash, the the SDK that we have on our website now, the consensus algorithm, is currently for the permission network and the SDK. If you'd like to learn more about the Hedera network, we're in a private testnet now. We are letting companies in in a queue order as they came to us. There's been a huge overwhelming interest from Solidity developers to use the Solidity script machine which is going to be great, but we have to control that. We will end up releasing fully, a fully documented version of the entire code base in the spring. Uh, we're fast approaching that. What we wanted to do is release it simultaneously. We're still doing it this way, where we have a full curriculum course that you go through where you get educated on how to use these services and how you can build your first app. Actually, I think we have a demo app that you actually build as you walk through. And then there will eventually be an account creation process. But the idea is this spring and it will be pretty developer friendly. So I know you might have mentioned something about like the end of April being like a release to like API like developers. So or? the APIs will be complete uh, yeah. from what we're iterating on now. By the end of April, we will yeah. be releasing publicly after that. Our team is in the process of documenting them now and writing curriculum for it now. We actually have a really cool curriculum platform broken down into modules where you would take this, you'd go through the course, and then at the end, you get a certificate that says you're certified, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Yes? Uh, so, in terms of open source, um, when is the, the, the incentive of forking the main chain uh, as the time goes by will become less and less for all those open source projects, I guess, uh, but the incentive of 39 companies without even them colluding is actually to uh, not accept any innovation after they get to a stable point. And I guess we have seen this on every major in, in, uh, initiative. Yeah, so you, how do you put innovation that can compete with the open source project yeah. in, in this? Yeah, so I would say, so it's actually one of my complaints with the big credit card companies is how slow that they move and adopt new standards and do things. Uh, we have, we prevent stagnation by kicking members out after a forced number of years. So they must go and the membership committee must replace them. Uh, that's not us, that's just part of, that's in the bylaws and in the constitution of how the council runs. So th that company will be replaced and they will continue to uh, ideally put new fresh blood on there that will then get the opportunity to earn money by issuing the governance of the, of the council. So that's one of the things, uh, as the network gets more usage, the members make more money, obviously. So the, the networks, the, the, the business is to sell the services. As the services are paid for, the members earn revenue on that, and the incentive is you want more high throughput transactions, you want more business coming to it. So I'd argue that they have the incentive to continue to innovate and draw that to the to the Hedera network. If they all start at the same time, they'll be kicked out at the same time. No, it's actually staggered. That's a good question. Uh, so they're staggered. There's a. Uh, it's actually written in the Constitution, but it's practically the founding members are kicked out, and there's a slower wave of how they're kicked out. I was going to say, I'm sorry, but, you know, we talk about tax liability, we talk about identification, you yeah. know, 
we've forgotten how this whole technology came about. Yeah. It's against tyranny. And, you know, Great. This, what this country started as and what it is now is two different things. Yeah, agree. No I, would, I would agree with that well, very completely. So, yeah. That's so where the problem I, is. We, we completely recognize and that this whole space came from, a, came from an economic disaster where trust was abused. I also think it's, it continues to be abused today where you have very little insight. Us, as American citizens, have very little insight into how much money our government continues to print. And I are, well, it's I not our government. It's the bank. And we're, we're slaves. We're, we're employees to the government, which is in turn an employee of the bank. Yeah, well, it's, it's and this is supposed to bring down the bank. Well, the central bank, the central, Whoa. the central bankers of the world that continue to print money. I'd say that if we had more insight into not just how that money was printed or when it was printed, but how it was used, you'd have better insight in how governments operate. And I'm not saying that that will ever happen on Hedera, but I'm saying that that will happen on a technology that's capable of powering an entire sovereign economy. And they would need to be able to track the currency. I'm going to make a bold claim. And yes, we've had preliminary conversations with central bankers, just where they brought us in to educate them on the space and brought Dr. Verdon and some of our developers. But we are, I think we're five years away from having a central bank, a sovereign nation, actually issue cryptocurrency as a sovereign currency. Then it's all over. Well, I, I think yeah, that, that's point. That's that's I, yeah, I, I think what you're going to see, I think what you're going to see is insight into exactly how much money is created, exactly what the money supply of some of these are. And I'll tell you, I think they're probably going to be in the more for, the more agile nations, the population size is closer to five million or less, and you can figure out what those are in the world. But there's a lot of there's a lot of POCs in the marketplace from these countries where they're working on this and they're doing it collaboratively. So it's going to be interesting. Yep. Have you released the names of any of the participants? Or any, uh, uh, I, I think one of them leaked out, but I, I'm not at liberty. I'm legally not allowed to mention any of their names, and I get a lot of trouble. Are you like under NCAs with these? We no. We just the, the state of where we're at right now. We've agreed that when we make announcements, we do it uh, collectively, and that we do it with them. With their, they're aware of what we're going to use the name. So they will obviously have their name used at full launch. They've all opted into that. So when the network is out, their names, the appointees, the, you can think of them like a board. The board members will be from each organization, will be public on the website, and the logos of the companies will be there as well. Are they only companies and the universities? Or? We, so we have another class of membership where we have many universities involved. We That's call right. them our advisory members. So okay. our advisory members, we have some really cool universities. That are those recommend. announced? Or? Those are, do we announce any university partnerships? I don't know why. Yeah. Somewhere I thought I saw one of the videos. You can kind of Stanford. you can kind of figure it out because it's the ones that keep inviting us to do things. <laughs> yeah, okay. So there's some really cool academics that have invited us to participate, and then we've invited them to post notes to have transparency into the network. And then we have associate members, which are they didn't quite meet the tier of best in their industry, but they were really fast in terms of what they're building and what they're doing with the technology, that we let them uh, get early access to the test net, we're letting them uh, put nodes on the network, and they are, you know, some of them, you probably saw our launch event, we had Machine Zone there, uh, they are one of them, Machine Zone is building uh, Satori, their pub sub yeah. platform, uh, <laughs> on top of Hedera, which is really, really freaking cool, which is awesome, yep. Yes, please. Um, you mentioned that uh, Hedera is for profit. Can yes. you talk a little bit about how they're funded and uh, how do they profit? Yes, so they profit, so how it's funded, it's a non-equity fundraise. Uh, they, the 39 own the organization, 139 equally across the organization. It was a non-equity fundraise through a SAFT where there was a crypto financing event where there was tokens pre-sold to the marketplace to get the initial capital. That money was used to hire teams of developers and teams of marketers and pays to keep the lights on and keep the organization running. That money is kept in trust. There's a certain amount that is kept in trust so the, continue, the, the business continues to operate. The business is to sell these public APIs. Every time that someone makes an API call, there's a small markup on the API call. So when you, when you want to send money across the network, you pay a transaction fee. The vast majority, 90% of that transaction fee gets distributed to the person who executed the transaction. The single mom in Australia, or Kyle, or you, or me, right? The person who's contributing the bandwidth, CPU cycles, and storage on the network, right? Now, if you're storing a file and someone's paying you per byte per second, you're storing that file on their behalf and you're getting paid to do that. You're getting paid per byte per second. 
So there's this economic incentive, much like miners are coming onto the Ethereum network to uh, give transaction confirmations. There's this incentive to provide these services. Everybody, everybody, including the members, provides these services by putting their computers on the network. The members have a ten, a ten percent. There's a I have to confirm the actual number, but there's a very a tiny markup on top of that that gets distributed to the members and gets paid out to them. So that is what they have as a, as a benefit of being members. Again, that position gets rotated, and they are selling, they're in the business of selling APIs, much like Twilio sells an API call or any sort of business that sells access to an API, the members are in the business of selling APIs. In the future, they may add additional services that also enhance and do other further things and adjust the plumbing to provide for and further enhanced anonymity. Um, but uh, that, that's, the, that's the economic model today. But Hedera itself is a private company and uh, the salaries of the people who are either equity holders or employees of Hedera it's so, not public, right? 139, so, so the so all of the equities, the cap gap is completely transparent. It's 139. Yeah. Um, the the, the, me the members get 139. Swirls. Swir yes, yeah, Swirls Sorry. is 139. Swirls is a private company. So the relationship between the two is Hedera is a completely separate k -ordic member funded organization. Swirls is a private business, right? And so that Swirls owns the patent. Swirls owns the patent, correct? And Swirls gives exclusive right to the patent to Hedera. There will never be another. And the 39 problem. companies are the only ones who profit. Uh, the 39 Swirls also profits, being one of the 39 as well. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the well, no. So, and, and I would say they're not the only ones who profit. The major, the majority of the profit, 90% of the profit, is attributed to the average person lending the computing power to the network. So the transaction fee, the lion's share of it, the, the majority that gets distributed to everybody's computers on the network, the members get a small markup on it. So the economic model is that all of us in the future will at home, you know, I, I'm going to even just, I'll just give my opinion on where I think the world is, has gone and came from. We went from data centers where you have to invest in this infrastructure, stand up this, you know, data center, which is quite burdensome. We've moved to public private cloud where you have this, this public cloud where people store their information. We're still in that transition, by the way. AWS is massive market share. We believe, as a company philosophy, that we're moving to this world where this new internet will be peer-to-peer. -peer. Instead like of mesh. yeah, like a mesh. Instead of you calling some AWS server and trusting AWS or Facebook with all of your information, you're storing it in this distributed, encrypted way where you can encrypt that file, store it on some random stranger's computer, and then call that file back up at your leisure through your at the application. So we believe in this peer-to-peer -peer internet where everyone in the world is connected. And when we're playing games, we're playing peer-to-peer, -peer, not how it is today where I ping central gaming server ping Kyle, right? And so I'm pinging directly to Kyle. So he could be in China and I can be in New York and we're playing complete fairness. Kyle knows he shot me before I shot Kyle. He wins the set round, right? So this is, that's the vision. To do that, you need every computer in the world to come onto a network, right? You need, you need Raspberry Pi, you need all of this cool stuff. Once that comes onto a network, you're going to get that cool functionality. Yes? So, so how will the compensation structure work for the average person in terms of, is it, is it dependent on the, the bandwidth, the recent amount of resources that they're contributing? So let's say you... you Time know, online, right? Online. So you have to be online to even get paid for a day. You get paid like you get paid to work for a day. So if you're online for 90% of the day, you get paid. You get paid for that day. But you get paid more for the bandwidth that you contribute to the network. So if you're if you're mining on, let's say this it's not possible today, but in the future it very well may be, where you get you're mining on your cell phone and you're on an LTE network, you're probably not gonna get as much as if you had a gigabit uh, plug-in, right? So bandwidth, CPU cycles, and storage. You have a ton of stuff stored and a ton of people on the network are storing and you're able to copy the database, you're gonna get paid a lot, right? You're gonna get paid per byte per second for that. So you get paid to work on that, and our cut is just that we've connected you to this massive global network, much like a visa. Yeah. You could like, kick up phone, and you could pay for Well, it. yes. So we do all of our testing today on Raspberry Pis, right. which are We're very small. Yes. Less we are moving to much more powerful machines to create a much faster starting point for network. The vision long term is that anyone with a mobile device can be gossiping about gossip or virtual voting on a network and making money. Right. Now, that may only be a few dollars per day, it may be maybe more, but that's going to change a lot of people's lives where that's the standard of living in some place in the world. Yes? Do you see the value of the currency as, staying, uh, as, as, as being very stable and not volatile with respect to the dollar? So 
I would say that I'm not an economist and I do not pretend to be, so that would be a tough question for me to answer. I would anticipate there to be a lot less volatility with our platform because of the governance and the controls. I would say the way we're running it is like running a publicly traded business where we do things a different way and we, we move slower, but it's more thought out, more methodical. I, I, can't, I can't answer the volatility question really. Um, we're, not, we're, not, we're not in the marketplace today. We've not distributed the token. Uh, we will. Um, but until it seems happens, to, to have held up the usage of um, a Bitcoin in, in commerce because your cup of coffee could end up being worth a thousand dollars if you were. Well, it'd be also you'd be waiting four hours to buy the cup of coffee. So uh, I'd argue that that's that that's the main problem with it. It's just not. It just the it. That, yes. Yeah. Dimitri. I was going to say also to answer the gentleman's question. Question. Perhaps also there is something to be said about the um, very the very. Uh, the, the hoarding impulse that's driven up the price of Bitcoin, how would that, if, let's say you guys have a, you know, so your market cap just blows up. Yeah. Um, that would change your release schedule as well, right, for, for tokens and how you would manage all of that. In other words, you'd be able to, 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 to scale the network faster. Um, I don't know, that, that I was kind of riffing off what you were saying, but I'm not sure if I was. Yeah, if we're, just, if we're just shooting from the hip here, yes, the members would have the, the, members would have the ability to increase the supply. What they, in terms of hoarding, because I think what you bring up is a really important point, you need to keep the coins on the network participating in consensus. So we have, we, the way we, and this is not delegated proof of stake, that's the wrong term for it. There's a lot of problems with DPoS. So what we do is we do a proxy stake where you can stake your coins. Let's say that uh, Dimitri has got a really big, super powerful computer at home, but all you have is your cell phone. And you want to give Dimitri the proxy rights to your coins for the day. Hey, Dimitri, hold on to my coins and you know, be gossiping about gossip and be participating in the network. Dimitri's gonna earn some money and he's gonna know exactly how much of that was attributed to how much you proxy stake with him and he controls the votes associated with those coins. You don't even have to trust Dimitri with those coins. So that's the default setting to keep the coins gossiping about gossip or keeping them on the network. But it also is gonna disrupt the banking model very much because effectively what Dimitri just became is a bank. Is a way, a safe place for you to deposit and make money because he's got high computing power. Now, long term, we're lowering, lowering the computing power required. I mean, we're doing testing privately now on 1080 Ti's, which are the same $600 chips or graphics cards that uh, uh, the Ethereum network is using. So as it gets lower, now you get really fast speeds when you do. And by the way, the only thing we're using a GPU for is digital signature verification. That's it. Right, we're just signing digital signatures on the GPU. So when we do that fast, we're doing the validation. Which one are we using for that? So uh, on AWS, we're using the B100, which is a, admittedly a very, very expensive car, very prohibitive. I think that's about $8,000. Uh, I was talking about the function. Oh, the function? Yeah. Oh, of the GPU? Yeah. I can't speak to the, fu the, the, the actual like the code. function you create to create the oh, okay. signatures. Good question. We're open sourcing that. So we've created. Yeah, okay, so we will, we, will, we will share that with the world, the yeah, actual what we're using. As it turned out, there was no library for it, so we wrote it, and we will share that with you. Um, and we actually wrote it with a, with a very large manufacturer of GPUs, whose name I cannot say. I have one last question. Really. Yes, yeah, please. The technical side. Yeah. The gossip of gossip, gossip seems to be a very interesting concept. I haven't seen it working anywhere else before. Sure. Maybe the most similar thing is sending massive updates to many nodes at the same time and trying to get an update one to the other. Yeah. But in, in what would you call that? Batching? Uh, uh, that updates over okay. here. Yeah, we'll it depends. Yeah. People call it in different names, like you you guys call things in different names. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, mean I, I, I get it, but uh, have you seen gossip of gossip working anywhere else before? Oh, so no. Uh, but that, that's what the patent is on. Lehman was the first to invent gossip about gossip, and we learned that when he filed the patent. We've not seen anyone in the market deploy it before. We assume that's why we got the rights to it. Uh, that the breakthrough is literally the the two hashes. So so when so the, if we were to look at an event in Hashgraph, a block is an event, right? If we were to look at an event, it would be a big circle. We'd divide the circle. You have a timestamp, okay? So you have this timestamp. You'd have an arbitrary transaction payload right under where you would have it's arbitrary to the business application. The cryptocurrency application is like hundred bytes. Under that, you have two hashes two bytes of information. One is the digital signature of the last person on the network who, who, you, who sent you a digital signed transaction, okay? So the last transaction from them. The other is the last transaction in your local copy of the database. With, that, with those two bytes of information, what we're building is a data structure 
where you have four nodes, okay? And time starts here and goes up over time. And what we're building is a graph where, I don't know if you've seen the image of the hash graph, but we have this I've graph where yeah, the I've lines are connected. I saw, I saw the yeah, so the lines the represent, the, the lines go down too. That may not be like very, I, I always comment that we have to make those bolder. The lines reference the, the last transaction, you as a node, the last transaction you have, and then the last one you receive from someone else. With these two bytes of information, we know everyone that's talked to everyone across time. And then we know what, if you have Alice, Bob, Carol, and Dave, we know Alice knows what Bob, Carol, and Dave know. Because she doesn't, she, she can just see their local copy of the hash graph. So we know when Bob rejoins the network, Alice and Bob do a quick sync event, and we know that Alice only has 10 digital signatures, but uh, well, Bob only has 10 digital signatures, Alice has, has 18, and there needs to be a sync to update that. And there's an incentive, by the way, to do that, where Alice gets paged to pass that information along. Yes. One thing I've missed in your presentation is it seems like you're mixing together proof of stake with proof of resources, meaning I have this much bandwidth, I have this much file storage. How are you aware that I have, you know, five of the eight thousand dollar GPUs and I'm being incentivized for that uh, participation? Yeah, I don't have the technical answer for that. I think there is a way to test what card you're actually contributing to the network, though, um, and when you sign up to the network. I, that's how it's for something can be measured. Yeah, it, it can, I believe it can be measured. I believe the mechanism for that's uh, so in what place. About file storage. In fact, I know, I know that's yeah. You would, well, in fact, you would need that to be measured because you would you would be able to measure um, to even opt into the file store to be able to make money doing that. You would have to disclose how many files you could receive. And I believe the requirement. We also have a starting a node spec. And it even includes a terabyte drive that you're starting with. So you'd be starting with you'd be starting with that. It also I, I bring this up. Lehman, the, one of the ways we've said we can do sharding is we can have a really fast shard and a really slow shard, and then you can have a really big storage shard and a really small storage shard, and you can shard that way. We talked earlier. You, it's a really bad idea to shard a New York shard or a Virginia shard. You don't want to shard that way because there's lots of ways to corrupt that or to take that down. So, and by the way, every shard is ABFT. When you start sharding, the entire network preserves ABFT. It's at random that a node in one shard would ping a node at the other shard. Now, I'm no expert on our inter-shard protocol and how we scale, but Lehman's presentation in New York gave some insight into that, and I'd be happy to share it. There's also more information in our white paper on how that grows over time, but it preserves ABFT. Yeah, I'd like to see his presentation on Yeah, that. I can, uh, if you go to hashgraph.com, there's a link to the replay oh, yeah. of that entire, the entire presentation. Yeah. Other questions? This was a tough, this is a good crowd tonight, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So is there a way that, uh, I'm just thinking, uh, just the way that it's organized, is there a way that the virus, for example, could propagate throughout the network? So the, what, what props, one more time? A virus. A virus would probably get across the yeah, network. Or well, you, you're, you're going to, I'm telling you right now, you will have a scenario where people store nefarious information in the file store. That every file store that has ever existed has that problem. Uh, LeaseWeb has that problem, right? I mean, I'll admit, we ran our VPN service through data centers. We had, you know, their stuff. We probably got more DMCA takedown requests than anybody, and we complied with every single one of them. You have to, right? It's the law. So if there's a takedown request, there's a mechanism in the file store called revocation where you can do a transaction. It actually costs money to do this transaction, but it costs money. You have to pay the node that's storing it to also delete it. So if you, if you create a file, you can also remove it. If there's some DMCA abuse file, someone's storing the whole, I don't know, fifth season of The Sopranos, you're probably going to want to you know, take that down. So, uh, and there's, there's legal mechanisms that we're gonna have to comply with as a company. We are already anticipating that. And, you know, it's much like a web hosting company. So there is precedent for, for that problem. That's gonna get a lot of people angry to watch yeah. the world stream a lot of video. Well, it also depends on what jurisdiction is the node in. If the node's in the Rock of Gibraltar, what jurisdiction are they comply with? What can you do? I mean, I, can I, can, like, you, have, you have to ask these questions. There's no legal precedent for any of this. And that's the biggest shock for me is, you would have thought that the lawmakers would have had this figured out. They're still figuring out, I think, like most of us. What did they just pass with the budget about accessing information? I thought they could do that now. So in the case of Microsoft. Yeah, they what's gave that? Them access to American to American data centers, but not access to foreign data centers because they're right. in a different jurisdiction. And I think the but it's not even a mechanism to do that, to go to Ireland and no, well, no. you have to comply with the laws of the local No, but, but, but those, uh, those sovereign states do comply with some of the PRISM standards where they can, you know, they will opt into global surveillance. So okay. you have those problems with those companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't, I don't have another comment on that. I'm surprised Zuckerberg wasn't asked more about prison. Or was he? I didn't see any of that. Because it's, a, it's, a, it's an aid thing. Yeah. Well, people who work at prison. Oh, right. Well, oh, they're also, so, the, senators, oh, the senators The senators keep it running, keep it funded, so they're not going to ask them about it. I like how we're talking about the prison leagues here. Yeah. <laughs> yes, please. So, governance and code reviews and all these review processes slow down innovation if you have tens of thousands or millions of people building on top of your network. Yeah, see, I don't, see, I don't think so, and here, here's why. There's, the idea is to deliver a platform, a set of tools. I see us as in the business of making these tools for the entire world to leverage and build really cool stuff. Like whatever you want, whatever you can think of, this is the platform where you're gonna go and you're gonna host it. You might store some of the assets to your app here, you might be using aspects of the micro payments here, and then you're gonna use Solidity scripts in the future, we're gonna do these in Java, which I think is really cool, and then you can execute these in a bunch of different ways. So I don't think that hinders innovation. I think what, what it encourages is, well first, let, let's start with another point. Is someone gonna build a DAP on a platform that's gonna fork tomorrow? That's gonna really screw up your DAP, right? If the platform forks, what happens to the cost of the gas price or the transaction fee? I think what the space needs is something stable with proper governance, and I think this is the way forward. I think that you know, this is controversial, and I get ripped apart for saying this, and please feel free to do the same, because I can take it, but anarchy, you know, being an anarchist is a great, they're, they're great catalysts for change. They've created this incredible new space, and I wouldn't even be working in it if they didn't do it in the first place. And I'm the well, first. It's not a comparison to. But it's, it's not a comparison to the other platforms. It's more so special. So to right, your, right. Well, we'll what what, what I what we recognize as a platform, as a company, is that there are problems in the space that can be attributed to a lack of governance. And there are platforms in the space that are preventing mission critical organizations, like many of the companies we're working with, from deploying applications. I do not think you are ever going to see a Red Cross application on Ethereum. I don't, I don't think that's ever going to happen. Please call me if it does. I just can't see it happening. Too much of what they do is mission critical. They need uptime. They need it to run. So how do you create a globally peer-to-peer -peer distributed main network without proper governance? I think what we're doing is encouraging more innovation that is skeptical to jump into the, to jump into the space now and to deploy applications that are going to change a lot of people's lives. Right? And the governance may not be the most popular way to do it, but at the end of the day, the end consumer gets a better quality of life because they're using a better application that actually has the ability to bank the unbanked and not just say it. Because what have we really done in 10 years? We haven't done a whole lot, right? This may actually give us a shot to get there. That's all I'm saying. Not saying it's, a, it's the answer, right? But I'm saying it's going to get us there. Uh, I agree. Yeah. By the way, it was called Cloud. It just passed with the budget. Has, yeah, it spells an acronym in Microsoft. Is that, that's the one they snuck into the They end snuck in. That's what I'm talking about. Poli Politicians. Yes. I'm ending on that note. Yeah. But I'll be around <laughs> and just hang out if you guys have one-on-one -on -one questions. Thank you so much.